I'm going to position them on the screen and rename Mr. Fisher. Okay. Asking the attorneys to start their videos on. I am admitting the law clerks into the waiting room, the courtroom. I am starting the recording and telling IT we can start. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. Case number 20-5221, Jason B. Lee, appellant versus Merrick B. Garland, Attorney General of the United States. Mr. Fisher for the appellant, Mr. Koppel for the appellee. Mr. Fisher, good morning. Um, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, uh, Morris E. Fisher for the appellant, um, Mr. Lee. So, um, Your Honor, the, the case basically, the three central points that I'd like to make in this case. The first is that with just, I just want to touch briefly on the Title VII and the uh, Equal Protection uh, Clause of the Constitution, that it's kind of like an either or here because um, the, courts, the court knows that uh, as established in um, some of these other cases, Webster versus Doe, that the, the Egan does not bar the information gathering aspect of what's involved in these investigations. Um, so really there's an issue then if we're going to say that Mr. Lee had a Title VII claim and that claim was timely based on the final ARC decision in 2018, then that claim was only on the information gathering stage of the case, and um, that's not barred by Egan. Okay, and it's just that the tangible effects of that information gathering stage didn't occur until there was a final adverse action in 2018. And then if the court, and then if the government argues, which their argument is, that Title VII doesn't even cover that, Meaning if Title VII doesn't cover that, so then we have the equal protection clause that does. And then if you look at the case of, the, um, of, the, of Davis versus Passman, where the court goes into a whole thing here about how these have to be the bulwark of, uh, against assumption of legislation, legislative or executive power, that this woman who was a congressional staffer who suffered discrimination had no other means to go ahead and um, bring her uh, discrimination case. That's where we need the equal protection um, clause right here. And I, and I know that Judge Katzis, I know that you had a, uh, had a concurrence um, in the Palmieri case that basically- said this was an open, Question. The big right. question here, which is whether Egan bars constitutional claims under the Equal Protection Clause, is an open question. Right. That's right. And I think that in some of these other cases, you don't have the government. I mean, because it's open, you don't you don't have authority that we can review this sort of claim, right? You're you're asking us to extend review beyond where we've gone before? Well, we, we know that basically we, we do have authority in Webster versus, versus Doe. We, we, the court does have authority. In, in some of these earlier cases, I know the court said something like, well, this guy was pro se and he had a 163 page complaint that nobody really understood, um, so on and so forth. Um, but now we don't have that. Like now we have, we have authority. I think we have authority from the Davis case. We, like, why is this case? Davis, Davis applied Bivens, 
which is a great case on implied judicial review authority, but Bivens hasn't fared terribly well in the last 40 years. I understand. And let, let, let me get it. And I think this is a good time here because in the time that we have left, and, and I don't think that this case required more than you know, 10 minutes of argument and so on. But I, I think that one of the things that I saw in the Ziegler versus Abbasi case dealing with the First Amendment was basically, look, the government orders hundreds of these illegal aliens into custody. Um, six Arab Americans, maybe rightfully so, didn't like it, said, look, you know, the people who kind of imprisoned us here, so on and so forth, um, we're going to go after them. And the Supreme Court said, basically, look, this is more of a policy thing. This, this is not really what Bivens is for. This is what you're really trying to do here is you're trying to go ahead and undermine or second guess a policy made at very, very high levels here in, the, in this country. And Bivens is not for that. And I think the district court judge in this case kind of sort of does the same thing. The district court says in his opinion that basically the decision to recognize a damages remedy requires an assessment of its impact on government operations system wide. Okay, that's not Mr. Lee's case. I mean, Mr. Lee is not saying, look, or here's what we want you to do. We want you to take a look at either a, the entire review process of how these polygraphs are administered. We want you to um, take a look, are we being uh, targeted in, we're, they're by, on a systemic level. Okay. They're asking more of these. No, no, that's, that's fair. It is your, your claim is individualized, right? But you are asking us to probe the motivation of the executive branch decision maker. And that is something that's pretty intrusive. But this is a lower level um, decision maker. And this is this is basically, you're saying, out of the scope of what he was doing. OK, I mean, and, and some of the things that we pled in the complaint. Not out of the scope of what he was doing. It's a perfectly legitimate function. Your theory is just he had a he had a bad motive. I mean, they're oh. they're entitled to examine people to make clearance determinations. They are not in the way that this uh, that this particular or these two particular uh, agents did. I mean, accusing this man of being a Chinese spy, along with him and his father, um, it, it, you know, it, and that affected our contention is that affected this person's um, that affected the test. Okay, uh, other people didn't have that. And then also the comments about the articles about, we don't think that you're loyal here because you put these articles on Fox news and so on and so forth. I mean, I think that's not a typical thing. You know, we're not saying that, listen, part of what the DOJ or the, or the FBI does here when they test for security clearances is really get under this guy's skin and really find the thing that's most sensitive about the guy and about the history and about his heritage. And let's see if this guy can withstand that kind of um, harassment and abuse. I mean, I, that's not, that, that, that is, there's no way that's the policy of the DOJ or whoever administered this test. Meaning these were rogue actions by these people. Um, and that's what distinguishes this case from the Ziegler versus Abbasi case. And that's what the, the fear, that's why there's no fear there. Well, there's always a fear, but I think that what outweighs the situation in Bivens, where we're going to have everybody in the world, every federal employee who doesn't have it their way, bring some sort of First Amendment claim or equal protection claim against whomever, okay, just for the heck of it, that, that's not this case. This if, is this is an if we rule, if we rule in your favor, yeah. as, as to reviewability, you're, you're, that might be an argument 
that some equal protection claims are stronger than others on the merits. But if we rule in your favor on reviewability, what limiting principle is there that would prevent everyone who was denied a clearance from challenging the motives of the people who gathered the information that went into that decision? I would say high level decisions in terms of how information is gathered, um, high level, def- high level um, decisions, even on um, how we're going to do things. Okay, similar to Ziegler versus Abbasi, where these decisions are made at very, very high levels. Okay, uh, I think that eliminates that class of claims for those people. Um, and uh, I just think that is enough of a protection. I think the court, I, I think the court has the ability to distinguish in those factors what's going to be an attack on the overall system and what's going to be an individual case for for this uh, employee. So that's a limiting principle, although a bit vague. But you're saying, well, we can handle that. It's a limiting principle that still. Um, allows any such case uh, coming from originating with the denial of a clearance, right? As long as, as long as the attack is based on, let's say what happened at the, uh, at the scenario. And it's against a low level person. And, and the claim is this particular guy, this particular official misused his power to affect something in the investigative process, which ultimately denied me my clearance. Yes, I think that's very fair. Um, Finally, just one, I see my time just is over, but the last point is that there didn't seem to be any argument at all against the injunctive relief on the First Amendment. I mean, if we go back to Paul Mary, I know that was one of the things that the court said is, you know, one of the reasons why we don't really have to decide this is because there was no argument by this guy on some of these other claims. So I I think in all fairness, the the case should proceed on that. But I think the Bivens issue is critical. I think that right now, free speech in this country is under attack. Okay, I think that we don't want a situation where someone has more rights on a Bivens claim on a sexual harassment or gender discrimination, which is a bad thing. I mean, everybody agrees that's a bad thing, but I don't think we want a system where, where that has greater protection than a free speech per, uh, case. All right. Thank you. That, that's nothing. Thank you. Mr. Koppel. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. I'm Josh Koppel on behalf of the United States. I just want to pick up on something that I think Judge Cassis was getting at earlier, which is that no court has ever held that a claim like this challenging the determination to revoke a security clearance may proceed either under Title VII or the Equal Protection Clause. And it simply can't be the upshot of Egan and the myriad cases in this court and the other courts of appeals dismissing Title VII claims challenging the revocation of a security clearance, that the plaintiff can simply move to, for leave to amend his complaint and relabel essentially the same allegations an equal protection clause uh, claim. And so, you know, there are really two reasons for this, which of course we set out in our briefs. The first is that as the Supreme Court held in Brown v. GSA, Title VII provides the exclusive judicial remedy for claims of discrimination in federal employment. And that's the holding of the Fifth Circuit in Perez v. FBI and the Ninth Circuit in Brazil v. Department of the Navy. The Title VII precludes an equal protection claim challenging the revocation of a security clearance. And second, the equal protection claim is barred by Egan. Of course, in Egan, the Supreme Court explained that the executive branch's power to deny or revoke a security clearance stems from the president's authority under Article II of the Constitution as the commander in chief. And the court explained that the predictive judgment of whether someone might compromise sensitive information can only be made by those with expertise in protecting classified information. Outside non-expert bodies like courts or the MSPB can't review the substance of that kind of judgment or determine what constitutes an acceptable margin of error. 
So, uh, you know, there's these a people- of, There's a lot of language in Egan that's very helpful to you. But on the other hand, I mean, really is a case about the authority of the MSPB to do statutory authority of the MSPB to review certain kinds of decisions under the CSRA, right? This is about, this is about the Article II interests of the president bumping up against the Article III. I, I, I imagine it's due process interests in securing review of constitutional claims. And I, just, I, I don't see a whole lot in Egan or Webster or the Title VII cases to help me resolve that question. So, so can, this, can, you give me, can you give me a sort of first principles way of thinking about this? Is, is this a Youngstown case? I, I think that uh, power is it a is it a um, is it a procedural do is it due process case thinking about Matthews balancing what what's the right analytical framework for weighing those constitutional considerations? I think that Egan is is an application of the political question doctrine, or at least establishes the basis for applying the political question doctrine here. And Egan establishes two of the Baker v. Carr factors, and any one of which would put you know, the, rev- the question of uh, whether a uh, security clearance should be revoked in the political quest, you know, w- would make that a political question. So first, Egan shows that there is, the Constitution contains a textually demonstrable commitment of authority to the executive branch. The president, again, is acting pursuant to his Article II power as commander in chief when, an, when the, the executive branch revokes a security clearance. And second, there's no judicially discoverable or manageable standard for reviewing the determination to revoke a security clearance. That determination requires a predictive judgment about uncertain future events and, and whether the, the employee or the, the individual would be able to protect classified information. That's not something within the expertise of, of a court. No, but I mean, we do think it's we normally think it's within the expertise of a court to make the sometimes very difficult judgment whether an executive actor is may, has made a decision for a prohibited reason like racial discrimination as opposed to for any other reason. Yeah. That's right, but you know, Egan again speaks to this specific context where you know there are uh, national security concerns, and the um, you know reviewing a Title VII claim, equal protection claim, doesn't only, of course, require determining whether uh, there was some kind of discrimination in in the process. Of course, then the court has to go on, you know, under the McDonnell Douglas uh, test. Look at the, here would be the FBI's proffered legitimate non-discriminatory reasons for revoking the security clearance and determining whether those would have supported the decision. And that is, you know, fundamentally a, 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 the, the kind of decision not within the expertise of courts that relates to, again, to the predictive judgment about whether someone, you know, uh, in, in future circumstances could be compelled to disclose sensitive information. So turning, you know, just touching very briefly on the Bivens point, because I, uh, that took a lot of time in, in uh, opposing counsel's argument. You know, the, the starting point, of course, is Ziegler v. Abbasi, and there's no question that this is a new context. And so extending Bivens to this context is certainly a disfavored judicial activity. But there's, and there are numerous special factors here that strongly counsel hesitation before extending a judicially created private right of action for damages. But the one that I really want to highlight is the concern that if polygraph examiners, decision makers, with regard to the decision to uh, revoke a security clearance, face the prospect of individual liability, they might certainly censor themselves, not ask the tough questions, not press the, the subject. 
you know, out, out of fear that, that they'll be subject to that kind of suit. And that is, you know, certainly very concerning in the national security context. So, unless the court has uh, further questions, we ask that the court affirm the judgment of the, of the district court. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fisher, why don't you take two minutes? Okay, thank you. So I think that the last point that my adversary made, I, I, I think that is the guts and the essence of this case, okay? Again, this is somebody saying, okay, Mr. Point 87 of the proposed amended complaint that Mr. Sebelia, the, the officer saying something that this you plaintiff you, Mr. Lee, this is a cowardly attempt to hide identity while posing knowing false disparaging remarks about the FBI in a news article. Okay, that is free speech. That is somebody's ability. That, meaning there was no contention here by the government that what you disclosed to Fox News was some sort of um, classified information or anything like that. Okay, it was you, you reported something, you reported a concern to the media. And I don't like it. And I think that your, uh, uh, your, your loyalty is in question for this, because this is a security force who ultimately is loyal to the president. Okay, and without getting over dramatic here, what does that sound like? Okay, isn't that any totalitarian regime? I mean, we have basically a constitution that steps in and says, this is different. This, this is not some policy thing or anything like that. This is a specific low level person that, uh, that infringed against this guy's ability for free speech. I have nothing further. Thank you. All right, thank you. Madam Clerk, if you'd call the next case. Case number 20-5151, Lori Marino, PhD et al. at Balance, Whale and Dolphin Conservation versus National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration et al. Ms. Lewis for the at Balance, Ms. Engels for the at Police. Ms. Lewis, good morning. Good morning, your honors, and may it please the court, Elizabeth Lewis for the plaintiffs. The principal issue in this case is whether plaintiffs' well-pled allegations are sufficient to support their challenge to NIMS's decision to no longer collect important data concerning the health and welfare of captive cetaceans. Accepting plaintiffs' allegations is true, there can be no doubt that plaintiffs' complaint meets the plausibility standard. Let me ask you about these allegations, about the, the existence of the report to begin with. Is it clear from the record that a uh, necropsy report was even prepared by AFIS or APHIS? Uh, Your Honor, uh, APHIS is not the agency that would be preparing the reports. Uh, the reports would be prepared by the uh, permit holders, um, and that is standard. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, you're right. Okay. Is there such a report? Do we know from the record? Um, we do not know for certain from the record. Um, we have alleged that there is a report. This is standard veterinary practice. And according to the terms of the permit, these necropsy provisions, the permit holders are required to um, prepare and submit a report to NIMS upon the death of the animal. Um, and, and that's you know, kind of the issue of, of the case is whether um, NIMS uh, decision to no longer collect these reports um, is uh, whether the agency has explained its decision adequately and whether have, uh, plaintiffs have standing to challenge that decision. Um, and uh, the court, uh, we asked this court to reverse uh, the ruling below for, for two principal reasons. Um, first, that the plaintiffs have established standing uh, by alleging concrete and demonstrable injuries to their professional and organizational interests. And second, that plaintiffs appropriately challenged final agency action. Um, and so to the first point, uh, considering the complaint in the light most favorable to plaintiffs, plaintiffs' alleged injuries fall well within this court's standing precedence. Standing asks the fundamental question, what's it to you? 
And plaintiffs have clearly answered by explaining how NIMS's decision to no longer collect uh, these necropsy reports harms them in concrete and specific ways. For example, the individual plaintiffs are scientists and marine mammal experts who study the impacts of captivity on cetaceans. To study the effects of captivity, plaintiffs rely on the key and rare data that are contained in these necropsy reports. NIMPS used to collect those data, which were then available to plaintiffs and others in the field. However, in March 2017, NIMPS announced that it would no longer collect certain necropsy reports. And because NIMPS no longer collects these reports, plaintiffs cannot access the important data that are contained therein. As a result, plaintiff science suffers. They find it difficult to pursue their chosen research questions, advocate for cetacean welfare and conservation, develop improved standards of care, and generally contribute to the scientific discourse to achieve better data-driven outcomes for cetaceans, both in captivity and in the wild. Uh, th this is clearly a concrete and particularized injury in fact, and indeed it is difficult to conceive it of an injury more personal than one to plaintiff's abilities to participate in their chosen professional field. Individual plaintiffs also explained that even as NIMS's decision that it would no longer collect the necropsy reports rendered them unable to obtain the data that's vital to their research, industry affiliated scientists retain unfettered access to the data and are able to, and do, publish papers that are not subjected to peer review and draw conclusions that are scientifically questionable. And before NIMS uh, decided that it would no longer collect the data, plaintiffs were able to access many of the same data um, as explained under the terms of these permits, the permit holders were required to submit these reports to the agency, which as the complaint alleges, were then made available to experts in the field. Um, and without access to those same data, plaintiffs face considerable difficulties when attempting to respond or dispute industry scientists' assertions and conclusions. And as a result, their voices within their field are diminished. And uh, this injury is highly analogous to the competitive injuries that are suffered, for example, by political actors uh, where this court has recognized that the relative diminution in a candidate's political voice may qualify as a sufficiently concrete and particularized injury for standing purposes. Plaintiffs likewise here are competitively disadvantaged as compared to industry-affiliated scientists as a direct result of NIMS's decision. Individual plaintiffs clearly allege specific ways in which NIMS's decision injured their professional interests in conducting high-quality scientific research, contributing to their field, and advancing their own research endeavors. These injuries stem directly from, and thus are caused by, NIMS's decision to no longer collect the necropsy reports. But, um, and, yes, I mean, your, your prayer for relief in this case is a little bit um, peculiar, let's say. I'm difficult to see how that's going to solve this problem. Uh, you want to vacate the decision, as you call it, um, saying we, 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 we don't have authority to do this anymore um, and uh, vacate the policy pattern and practice invoking and applying that decision. So then what happens? Well, Your Honor, uh, the agency would have to explain um, its view. Uh, it would have to explain its position that uh, as to why the uh, um, amendments to the statute, the 1994 MMPA amendments, extinguished um, those permit provisions to date. The agency has not ever explained this position. They've said that they've prepared a legal memorandum. Um, they say that they uh, you know, have, have made this decision, uh, but they have not offered any explanation uh, further in, uh, in Aikens, um, where the uh, plaintiff challenge a, a general um, enforcement policy, uh, redressability was not defeated simply because the agency could reach the same result uh, via a different method. Yeah, um, one of your clients has a, a FOIA case pending, correct? Uh, they did, Your Honor. Does it, does it request the uh, legal opinion? It, it did, Your Honor, yes. Um, and, okay, seemed, and where does that case stand at this point? Um, at this point, uh, pl uh, plaintiff's uh, request for the uh, memorandum was was denied. It was withheld under exemption um, five, I believe. Is that a final decision? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. So is that on appeal? No, Your Honor. Will it be appealed? 
No, Your Honor. So the what was the ground for denying you access? Um, it was attorney work product. Um, and so it was a, a judge at Coder Catelli uh, held that it was um, w appropriately withheld under FOIA. So if that's attorney work product, somewhere there's a final document or legal opinion, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Um, and go on. Oh, uh, the uh, the email um, that we've attached um, in our uh, joint appendix um, makes reference to that memorandum as the basis for uh, NIMS's decision and application of its policy to um, plaintiff's request. So it's now race judicata that you cannot get that opinion. That's correct. Um, and yet that's part of your relief here, is it not? We are not asking for the agency's legal um, opinion uh, or, or advice. We're asking for the agency to explain its, its policy. Um, within the agency's uh, legal the opinion, you know, as a- The explanation is we have the legal opinion. Here's the legal opinion. Well, Your Honor, um, we don't know what's in that legal opinion. It could be uh, an evaluation of litigation risk. Um, it could be, uh, you know, any other uh, legal advice that would be appropriately withheld um, from a client, uh, from the attorney to the client. Um, what we are seeking and what the agency has an obligation under administrative law principles to provide is an explanation for its decision, for its enforcement policy. So you said in the at page, uh, pardon me, at um, paragraph 60 of your complaint, which is on page 34 of the joint appendix, um, about seven lines down or so, uh, Ms. Lewis, if NMS, what do you call it, NIMFS, determines at any point that the applicant or facility holding the mammal, the marine mammal that is subject to, the, to a special exception permit no longer meets those requirements, it may revoke the permit and seize the animal. So there's no, there's no uh, certainty or at all that this litigation will result in actual revocation or enforcement in any way. We are not seeking to have any particular permit or animal um, seized or, or moved. Uh, what we are uh, seeking is the information that NIMS is supposed to have in its possession uh, under the terms of the permit, these uh, the FOIA case here, you're seeking uh, vacating the email and the policy, right? Uh, yes, Your Honor, the policy, not not any um, permit. The uh, How would policy. You the policy. The policy is to what? Not enforce the permits. Uh, the policy is that uh, NIMS has determined that the 1994 amendments have extinguished these certain permit provisions. Um, and because a, these permit legal. provisions are no longer valid, right. the, uh, excuse me? That's not a policy, that's a legal decision. What's the policy based on it? That is the, pol the policy is that NIMS will no longer be uh, requesting or collecting this information. Okay, so, so if that is vacated, it goes, we go back to the situation where the agency may revoke the permit, right? If that's vacated, then the necropsy provisions, these provisions that we're discussing, remain valid and remain uh, parts of the permit holder's legal obligations as a condition of holding that animal. And therefore, when that animal dies, as Tilikum did, as Kasatka did, then that facility is under an obligation under that still valid a provision of its permit to submit this information to the agency as they uh, used to be so obligated to do. To figure out, it seems to me that it's very peculiar the way this is framed as to whether it is a, what's been called in another case a programmatic attack or an attack on specific challenge to, I should say, specific um, enforcement decisions. If it's a programmatic attack, you have a problem. If it's a challenge to specific enforcement decisions, you have a Hector V. Cheney problem. So you're slicing the bologna very thin, it seems to me, where you say in here, uh, well, in the way in which this, this whole thing is framed up, trying to, I mean, on the one hand, you say at various places, you're not challenging specific um, 
uh, instances, correct, of failure to, to act. We aren't challenging the agency's uh, decision not to enforce um, you know, that is a heckler problem. But in making this decision, the agency didn't rely on its prosecutorial discretion. Um, and so this case, you know, it falls under that uh, heckler exception where we are looking at this policy that is being applied in a way that injures plaintiff's interests. Um, and I want to declare vacate a, the policy pattern and practice. Why isn't that a so-called programmatic attack? We aren't attacking or challenging uh, the agency's overall administration of the special exception permit program. We are attacking their application of, of this policy, which we find, which we believe is uh, arbitrary and capricious to um, the specific uh, denials of, of uh, plaintiff's requests in these specific instances, which is the normal course of challenging um, agency action, agents, broad agency policies in the APA context. Thank you. Could I ask, uh, on the standing, at least of the organization, how do you distinguish EPIC? And that's an opinion where we spoke at length about Aikens, which is the font of informational injury theories. We spoke at length about Havens, which is the font of organizational injury theories. We spoke at length about PETA, which is, I think, your best case for organizational standing here. And we said pretty clearly that if you don't satisfy Aikens, you don't have an informational injury. And if you don't have an informational injury and the harm to the organization is not getting information, that's a very good indicator that you don't have organizational standing. Well, Your Honor, I would distinguish uh, Epic on uh, two grounds. First, um, on the facts, um, the main issue in Epic was not that Epic didn't have a, uh, a statutory entitlement to uh, that information. In fact, the court expressly did not assess that first factor uh, when assessing informational standing. Um, the issue was that Epic didn't have a cognizable uh, interest in the information at issue. Um, there was a privacy assessment that was protecting, focused sorry, on protecting no, what, individuals. What, sorry, what would, would create the cognizable interest and in a concrete Article Three injury other than a statute like FOIA or FOC? Well, um, I mean, it, if the plaintiff has, uh, it's it's more akin to the, the zone of interest. And you can see this uh, analysis actually in the Friends of Animals versus Bernhardt case, where uh, plaintiffs in that case, uh, Friends of Animals had a, uh, an organizational injury, they, they had organizational standing without any statutory right to that information. And in fact, uh, Judge Silverman in a footnote noted that that ship has sailed um, on the argument that plaintiffs are required to plead a statutory entitlement uh, to the information at issue. It's just hard for me to see how if you, if you don't have a statutory right to the information. This isn't just a generalized grievance or an ideological interest. Well, uh, the other elements of organizational injury do guard against that. Um, you know, you can't, uh, organizational injury also requires the plaintiff to prove that there's a direct conflict with uh, the, the mission, that there's a consequent drain on the resources. An organizational plaintiff could not come in and just say that we have been deprived of information that we want and have organizational standing. That's not the test. The test is that they have to allege a concrete and particularized injury of which the deprivation of information can be one, uh, but they also have to allege those other elements, which is, ensures that uh, the, the action, uh, that, that the injury is not uh, generalized. Could an individual similarly situated to PETA run the same theory, which is to say, okay, I don't have, I can't cite any statute 
giving me a right to information. And all of my harms flow from the failure to get information. But you know what? I'm really invested in this issue. And I do, I, I broadcast all of these things on my own as an individual. So that failure to provide information harms me as an individual more than John Q. Public. Would that be a good theory of standing for the individual? Yes, Your Honor. And in fact, um, in the American Friends versus Webster case that is cited in the briefs, that is the exact injury that was alleged. The Federal Records Act does not give uh, plaintiffs a right to the information. All that provides is that the agency has to collect and retain certain records. Um, and so that injury is highly analogous. And, you know, again, um, I say that in order to show that um, the plaintiff is, is injured, they do have to show that that deprivation impacted them in a concrete and particularized way, which is what individual plaintiffs have shown here. And it's what the individual plaintiffs in the American Friends case did. So any, so any individual with the, the canonically non-concrete injury of being offended at how the executive branch is conducting its business can create Article Three standing just by um, engaging in an issue and saying, I, I want to publish this information to expose the maladministration of the program. Well, Your Honor, I think that, you know, as with all standing questions, it's a highly fact-specific um, question. Here, um, you know, our plaintiffs are undisputed uh, experts in their field. Well, I don't, I'm not questioning their commitment, sure, but it just seems like that blows a pretty big hole in some basic standing principles. I, I in with individual um, plaintiffs, you know, they have a longstanding um, demonstrated interest in this topic. They've been able to show that they are harmed by this deprivation in very concrete and particularized ways. Um, and, and that is the key. Uh, and they have a cognizable interest in their career pursuits. This court you know, previously has recognized um, plaintiff's interests in, in maintaining their careers and engaging in their careers. Um, and when a government action does impact that, again, it, it, you need a final agency action, all the other elements must be satisfied. Um, and you know, additionally with reputational injury, that is also well established when all those uh, requirements are satisfied. A plaintiff does have standing to to challenge a government action that that injures its concrete um, interests. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Judge Ginsburg, do you have any other questions? Oh, thank you. All right. And we'll hear from uh, Ms. Engels. Good morning, and may it please the court. I'm Summer Engels for the Federal Appellees, and we ask the court to affirm. At its core, this case is about plaintiffs' effort to derive information potentially relevant to their interests from the services regulatory relationship with SeaWorld. But because they're not entitled to that information, they lack standing. And even if they had standing, they have failed to state a claim because they have not identified a final agency action. For those reasons, we ask the court to affirm. I'd like to begin today with standing and specifically the government's argument that plaintiffs uh, have asserted and failed to satisfy uh, in the relevant test for informational injury. All of plaintiffs' harms here stem from the sense that they've been deprived of information that, that they want the government to produce, and therefore they've triggered the two-part test for informational standing. And the first part of that test asks whether they, whether they have a statutory entitlement to that information. Plaintiffs here identify no statutory entitlement, and in fact, they assert that they're not obligated to identify an entitlement at all to satisfy the test. Suppose you're right about that the informational injury part of your case. They couldn't establish informational injury under Aikens. Their theory is they don't have to because they satisfy a different organizational injury test. And as some of my questions suggested, I, I find that a little bit problematic, but what do you do with Bernhard, Friends of Earth, Friends of Animals versus Bernhardt? I mean, it's a, it's a 2020 case from this court 
And all you, all you say in your brief is you just give us a but see sight to it. That's right. really not good enough for a panel bound by precedent. Under understandably, I, the relevant discussion in Bernhard was a, a one one line footnote, and we think the case is distinguishable because at least there the plaintiffs asserted that the Endangered Species Act required the Fish and Wildlife Service to publish information in the Federal Register rather than uh, complete it on a case by case basis or, or uh, that wouldn't be subject to publication and, and that deprived them of information. So in that sense, even though the court said in the footnote that the ship had sailed, uh, there was still at least some basis for the plaintiffs to say that they had an entitlement to that information. Now, Bernhard is a, a unique sorry, case. I missed, sorry, I missed that. Help, walk me through that. Yeah. So, the Bernhardt decision said the ship has sailed, but in the section after that, when the court Ships, ship has sailed on the proposition that the lack of the failure to satisfy the informational injury test under Aikens defeats the claim of organizational standing under Havens. That's how I read it. So what that is correct. Missing? The court was saying that the first part of the informational injury test, which requires the identification of some statutory entitlement, um, that that element had sailed. But I think that Bernhardt can be read comfortably with the other informational standing precedents and is distinguishable from this case because there the plaintiffs were claiming that the agency's change in procedure deprived them of information that they asserted had to be published in the Federal Register. And here we don't have any sort of similar statutory or even regulatory hook uh, that, that gives the plaintiffs any sort of right to information. Now, the statute at issue in Bernhardt was different from other classic informational injury statutes, but I think uh, because it could be read broadly as a disclosure um, provision, it can be reconciled on its facts. I mean, but I it, would... It's, it's not the more obvious reading of Bernhardt. I guess your position has to be that a broad reading of Bernhardt would bring it into conflict with Epic. And so we need to, um, I don't know, spin sounds pejorative, but we need to narrow it because Epic seems strongly in your favor. That's correct. Also, I would point the court to TransUnion, which confirmed again that the first part of the informational injury test requires the identification of a statute. Um, also, Friends of Animals v. Jewel, which came after the PETA decision, held that the plaintiff there didn't have standing because it couldn't satisfy the first part of the informational injury test. And the, the requirement to identify at least some statute requiring disclosure or publication is very important. Uh, as the court recognized in the Ling case, informational in injury in its broadest sense exists day in, day out, whenever federal agencies create information that a member of the public would like to have. And so it's necessary to have this hook to ensure that we're not opening up a Pandora's box or articulating a rule that lacks a limiting principle. Um, and also the idea that an organization has um, developed activities centered around information does not mean that they should be able to evade the two-part informational injury test. The um, Judge Millett's opinion in, in um, PETA v. USDA explained that there's no reason to allow an organization to proceed where an individual might fail. And I think plaintiffs identify or, or seek to identify what they assert are, are limiting principles in the organizational injury analysis, but um, the court explained in Epic that if an injury, if a plaintiff or organization says that it's harmed because its activities have been impaired because they don't have information, um, if they don't have a legal entitlement to that information, then the, art, the injuries are sort of self-inflicted. And I think that's the problem here. Um, even if we look at the organizational standing test, which we don't think is the proper framework for this case, plaintiffs' arguments fail because they don't have any hook uh, that entitles them to this, this information. Separate from the legal entitlement or um, informational injury analysis, they also fail 
the organizational standing analysis because they haven't showed that they've um, undertaken additional expenditures or changed their resources to account for any sort of government decision here. On J23, they talk about the fact that they will spend resources submitting FOIA requests and observing whales, but they identify no um, basis to, or they don't allege that these are changes in resources. The record also makes clear, the, the complaint makes clear that they have spent resources submitting FOIA requests and observing whales all along. In the reply, they say that they will submit more FOIA requests and spend resources identifying other agencies to submit the requests to, but that's just not part of the complaint and they cannot amend it through, um, through briefing on appeal. Ms. Engels, can I ask you um, the same uh, question I asked Ms. Lewis? Uh, this is a suit about information, get, getting information that may not even exist. And we are all tied up in standing and I'm more concerned about redressability. Do we know on this record whether the necropsy was performed, whether the report was made, prepared, and whether it still exists in view of this three-year retention policy? So I can tell you that the, the services position is that in 1994, it was uh, its authority to oversee the care of captive marine mammals was transferred or it was made clear that it was within the wheelhouse of the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which has extensive regulations that apply to this sort of, um, to, to these sorts of activities. 9 CFR 3.100G says that, um, that captive facilities that hold these marine mammals uh, need to prepare necropsy reports and uh, keep them for three years so that they can be available for APHIS when they're requested. Now, I think I cannot confirm, I have not seen these reports. My client is not the agency responsible for these reports at this point, but based on the regulations if SeaWorld is complying, the report should have been produced in 2017 for APHIS's inspection. Um, so have the plaintiffs sued the wrong defendant? I don't feel comfortable saying that they, if they sued APHIS, they would get the reports. I think that if they wanted to get them, APHIS is the better party because they're the, they're the agency responsible for regulating uh, the care and taking of captive marine mammals. They have in the past undertaken inspections of these reports. I don't know that they've done it here. I think for relevant purposes, the problem is that the, the orcas of interest to plaintiffs died in 2017 and now more than three years have passed. So it's possible that the reports are lo no longer available uh, just based on the way the, um, the APHIS regulations have worked. Well, but there's nothing that set, orders them to destroy them after three years, right? That's true, that's yeah. true. It's just that they have to be maintained for three years. And, right. and so I can't say confidently that they're still available or that that would be an avenue of, of redress. But, um, but in any event, that's, that's a, a regulatory regime that's not managed by the service. It's managed by USDA and the Animal Plant right. and Health Inspection right. Service. All right, are there any more questions of Ms. Engels? Oh, thank you. All right, Ms. Lewis, why don't you take two minutes? Thank you. I just have um, four quick points. Um, as uh, Your Honor noted, um, the regs uh, require the preparation of this report and um, NIMPS has never denied that they exist. So at this stage, um, we think that the complaint does plausibly infer that they do exist. Um, and we are suing NIMPS over its decision with respect to a permit over which it does have jurisdiction. I issued the permit, um, that's the whole, um, issue in the case. And so we do, uh, the NIMS is the proper agency uh, for us to be um, suing. Um, and as far as uh, Friends of Animals uh, versus Bernhardt, um, there's a huge difference between uh, a claim that the agency could not proceed uh, by making these case by case uh, determinations without a regulation um, versus a, an affirmative disclosure requirement, which this course, court's precedents have made it extremely clear that in a very clear firm statutory entitlement is required to form the basis of uh, informational standing. 
And so uh, informational standing was, was very clearly not alleged in that case. It rested entirely on organizational standing. Um, and to your Honor's question um, about EPIC, again, EPIC did not rely on a statutory entitlement to deny uh, informational or organizational standing. Um, and we'd also remind the court that uh, PETA uh, in the seminal case on this issue also did not have a statutory entitlement to the information that it sought, yet still had organizational standing. And Judge Millett's opinion, in fact, uh, noted that the majority's opinion uh, walked the path uh, with circuit precedent um, in finding that organizational standing existed even without a statutory entitlement to the information. And if the court has no further questions, uh, we respectfully request that the ruling below uh, be dis uh, overturned. Thank right. you. Th thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Clerk, will you give us a short recess, please? This honorable court will now take a brief recess. Judges, if you could please give me one minute while I uh, put the broadcasting PC and everybody else into the waiting room. Thank you.
everybody else back as well. This honorable court is again in session. Court number, case number 20-1388, California Public Utilities Commission petitioner versus Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Ms. Mori for the petitioner, Ms. Rylander for the respondent. Ms. Mori, I'm also glad to see you. We've been trying all morning to find you, so that's okay. Please proceed. I apologize. Please proceed. I've, I've been watching, so I don't know what happened, but thank you. Good morning. And may it please the court. I'm Candace Mori on behalf of petitioners. The California Public Utilities Commission asks the court today to remand the commission's order. The commission arbitrar arbitrarily and capriciously approved a new filed rate formula that can overpay resources for backstop capacity without any safeguards to protect consumers or even other sellers in the market from windfall profits. It did so with no evidentiary basis without addressing the compelling concerns and contrary evidence that parties raised and based on nothing more than conclusory reasoning. To further explain the gravity of the commission's error and why the law requires remand, I'd like to present three arguments this morning. First, why preventing windfall profits is important to California ratepayers whose interests the commission failed to consider. Second, that this court's recent decision, Delaware Division of the Public Advocate versus FERC, compels the same outcome here, remand. And third, that remand is necessary to clear up this key question. What costs, if any, above our resources going forward costs should be guaranteed in the voluntary CPM capacity market, given that the ISO maintains mandatory backstop procurement power through its reliability must run tariff? Now, first, this case matters because the commission has fail to fulfill its core statutory duty to protect consumers. The words consumer, ratepayer, do not even appear in its order. The ISO pointed out to the commission that capacity markets are tightening in California. Parties submitted evidence that CPM, the capacity procurement mechanism at issue here, that those CPM solicitations have become structurally uncompetitive and that CPM sellers have market power. And that was before a prolonged extreme heat event in California caused reliability problems in the summer of 2020. In California, we have a history of sellers exerting market power to gain excessive compensation and harm ratepayers. And the new rate makes this even easier. It streamlines the process to get commission approval to make offers above the competitive soft offer cap and guarantees them a 20% adder whether they need it or not. The stage is Can I set. Ask you just a basic question about the structure of this and why it matters, which is I mean, usually a tariff price, it's just the price that the utility will um, charge. And if the consumer wants power, they have to pay that price, and that's it. This case seems a little unusual. This is just about. Um, bidding options, right? And the above cap rate, on the one hand, it seems a little bit strange, but on the other hand, um, it only becomes relevant if um, that's the price for clearing the market and if lower bids are not accepted. And it seems like the history under this program is, as if, I'm, if I understand it, there's never been an above cap rate that's been the market clearing price. So mm -hmm. I mean, if someone can make a bid at cost plus 500% and no one ever buys at that price, what, what are we arguing? Why, why does that matter? Well, the context here is, um, is important, as you know. In California, the primary market for procuring resource adequacy to make sure we, that we have enough capacity uh, to meet our energy needs is through bilateral contracting. We have a bilateral uh, resource adequacy um, as our first 
uh, stop, you'd say, for buying capacity. And then in addition, the California ISO has two different options to procure backstop capacity. The first one is this capacity procurement mechanism. And so if there is a deficiency in the resource adequacy showings or an unexpected event, it can go to this market, the CPM solicitation, to buy that capacity. And the other one is a mandatory reliability must run program. So if resources are looking to mothball or shut down, then that's where they go to make sure they're getting enough cost recovery to stay in operations. And so you're getting back to your question, in CPM solicitations, in 2015, the ISO proposed changing this market from a fixed administrative price. So every resource would have been paid the same, one, one price. And it went to a competitive bid process. And now this is pay as bid. So there's not a market clearing price. Each resource that bids in, if it's needed, it gets the bid it submitted. And an important part of that switch, which was part of a broad settlement that all parties agreed to, was that there needed to be a market mitigation measure there. And that market mitigation measure is that soft offer cap price. And so there's a formula that says, this is the price that you get to bid up to with no justification of your costs. But what we're talking about today is bids above that soft offer cap price where resources that are the highest cost need, need some more money. Yeah, I understand that. And I understand they, they get the bid price, but that's only if the ISO accepts that bid, right? That's correct. But um, this is a filed rate is the other important aspect of this. So this is a cost-based showing that the resources make in order to be able to bid above that soft offer price. And it's important because whether it's been used much before in the past, it's really not a good predictor of the future here because the capacity markets are tightening in California. And when sellers have market power, it is not just unreasonable to pay them more than the cost they need to incur to pay to, to provide that cap capacity service. And now the second point I wanna make is that the court here is compelled to reach the same outcome, which is remand regarding this automatic 20% adder that it's giving resources, um, as in the recent decision authored by Judge Henderson, the Delaware Division of the Public Advocate v. FERC. And the case is so strikingly similar here to this one in the ways that the commission failed to engage in reasoned decision-making. And before making that analogy, I'll just give you a quick recap here. Here, the ISO did not provide, and the commission did not rely on any data or evidence showing that the CPM, the capacity procurement resources, need or will use this automatic 20% adder that's given on top of their demonstrated going forward costs. They did not show that those resources will use or even need that adder for maintenance and upgrades. And in the ISO's energy markets, Another key point is these resources retain all of the energy markets that they earn. And those energy bids, they're allowed to recover long-term maintenance and upgrade costs. The Department of Market Monitoring, which is the independent market monitor, asked the ISO for this assessment and never provided it. And the commission never responded to this issue. It didn't say anything uh, in response to arguments that resources are already earning enough money through market revenues in this competitive solicitation and that it's just windfall profits to give them this extra 20% booster. <clears throat> the commission simply concluded that the inclusion of a 20% adder on top of demonstrated going forward costs is consistent with commission precedent on CPM compensation. And now if this all sounds really familiar, uh, this failure to engage in reasoned decision-making, it should, because it was the same flaws the commission, <clears throat> uh, the same failures of the commission in reasoned decision-making in the Delaware Division of the Public Advocates versus FERC case. And now, before I conclude, I wanna make one final point today. The commission has never answered this looming and critical question which is just fundamental to this uh, competitive solicitation. And again, this is a voluntary 
backstop capacity market. And it's never said, well, what costs, if any, should these resources be guaranteed to recover in addition to keeping their market revenues and in addition to a capacity payment that covers their actual and demonstrated going forward costs. And this is a critical in 2020 right now because of recent reforms that the ISO has made to better distinguish this voluntary and competitive backstop market from the ongoing mandatory reliability must run program. And it's not even clear that the ISO itself agrees what additional fixed costs this capacity price should pay for. And this clarity is critical because California's new rule does not follow the guidelines and directives that the commission has given in the New York ISO in two orders where it addressed this very same issue about payments in a voluntary backstop capacity market. And now to look back at what guidance the commission has given on CPM compensation in California, we wind back through its 2015 CPM order to the 2011 CPM order. In that order, the commission rejected a proposal the ISO submitted. We don't think that compels any particular outcome here uh, because again, California's resource adequacy program, which provides most of our capacity and the ISO's market rules have evolved significantly since 2011. But in that order, the commission expressly identified long-term maintenance and other improvements such as environmental upgrades, as the type of money it wanted to make sure CPM resources could recover. And now I just want to leave the court at JA21 here before I go. In its own transmittal letter and answer, the ISO itself said that it is not just and reasonable to pay capacity procurement mechanism resources for their actual long-term costs and upgrades. It says the reliability must run mechanism is much better suited than this voluntary backstop market to address the recovery of long-term maintenance and upgrade costs that may be needed. And in its own words, the ISO said, these kinds of costs could be millions and millions of dollars. And it asked if they should even be accommodated under the CPM framework. Now, I'm not sure how it can be unreasonable to pay a resource for long-term maintenance costs it actually incurs, but then reasonable to pay them for these same kinds of costs, only so long as they are unknown, approximate, and not necessarily incurred. And the ISO never explained that. And so it is critical to make sure. Um, and one other thing is the ISO also identified that there are no provisions to prevent resources from going back and forth between this market rate that's supposed to be competitive and the filed rate that they're gonna get approval from FERC on with a 20% adder. And this, this clarity is needed and remand is needed for the commission to make sure that this new rule that's passed in California is consistent with its policies and other ISOs. Now, if there are no other questions, then I will reserve the remainder of my time for a rebuttal. All right, uh, we'll hear then from Ms. Rylander. Good morning. May it please the court, Elizabeth Rylander for the commission. What's required of the commission in response to a Federal Power Act Section 205 uh, rate, uh, rate application like this one is that it use its technical understanding and policy judgment to evaluate whether that rate's just and reasonable. California Commission's cho uh, challenge here is to that policy judgment, which has been developed over many years of evaluating proposals for the California ISO uh, as to how best to procure ca capacity in its region and how best to balance the, va the various um, mechanisms for obtaining that capacity. Um, as Ms. Mori has noted, the capacity markets and the energy markets are not the same. Um, and the uh, compensation mechanism here applies just to what is necessary to, uh, to entice resources to be available to generate energy if necessary. It's completely separate from the compensation that, uh, that arises from, pro that from providing that energy. So the capacity payment has to be sufficient um, to bring generators into the market no matter what happens after that. Excuse me, the, the energy market you're referring to then is the 
uh, the consumer's payment of, of uh, monthly electric bill? Um, Your Honor, I... Um, you said there's capacity... That would be a retail... Le- Go ahead. That would be a retail level... Um, that would be okay. a retail right. level bill that is not subject to the commission's jurisdiction. Okay. What I mean is... Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so then... Um, once the capacity is brought online through these incentive payments, basically, then the the owner of the capacity generates and keeps the revenues from the first sale of the energy, as well as whatever it's gotten from for bringing the capacity online. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so, what's at issue so, here? So, just. I had the same question. Is it, is it, this is a, this capacity is a kind of option contract, right? Yes, I and think that's a fair characterization. Just, is, it, is it fair? Am I thinking about things in the right way to think of the, these payments we're talking about is just the price of buying the option? as opposed to the strike price, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, and this court has considered a number of cases that a number of regions um, in previous years of California and elsewhere concerning, capa- concerning capacity markets, how they work and what their function is. And, and just so just one other nuts and bolts question before you get into the guts of your argument, which is with that in mind, um, what is the conceptual difference between going forward costs, which you generally think could be compensated as part of the option price, and all other costs, which we were talking about the cost, the underlying cost of providing the service, you would think the provider should recover all of its costs. So what's the difference? What, what are what distinguishes going forward costs in this context? Going forward costs are a narrower set of costs than uh, are a narrower set of costs than full fixed costs. Um, and in this case, um, I believe there can be more than one definition of going forward costs. But um, here, it's just three yeah, I, narrow I, categories. I, yeah, I get that. I have in my notes it's mm-hmm. fixed operating and and maintenance costs. Ad valorem taxes mm-hmm. and insurance costs. And insurance. I understand the point that that's a proper subset. Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand what the economic or practical significance is between those costs and other costs that aren't included in this option price. Mm-hmm. Um, I would characterize it as short-term costs versus long-term costs. And the commission's orders also draw this distinction um, in a a couple of places, I believe in 2011 and 2015. uh, What the commission found is necessary in this case is is to provide an incentive, not just for capacity providers to enter the market to provide capacity, but also if um, there is a resource that um, is maybe not very economic, and that is at risk of retirement, there needs to be some incentive to remain in the market. There you get to longer term costs, such as maintenance, um, uh, long term maintenance and capital improvements, which are referenced in the orders. Okay. So then can I ask you, so the what the 20% adder, which is a structural feature of this. What is that designed to do? I I could think of three possible reasons for having an an adder. Mm -hmm. One is one is to account for the fact that there are costs that aren't going forward costs, 
One is to um, account for the fact that you want a reasonable rate of return above and beyond costs. And a third, which I think is what's going on here, but I want to make sure, is to account for the fact that if you just pay average costs, if, if what you're trying to do is compensate going forward costs and you just pay an average, that won't be adequate for high cost producers on the right-hand side of the bell curve. And the 20% is designed to account for that. Yes, Your Honor. Um, paragraph 36 of the order on review discusses this somewhat. Um, in explaining that um, the 20% adder um, is intended to, uh, to provide for sufficient recovery of fixed costs, which is the broader category Your Honor was asking about earlier, plus a return on capital to facilitate incremental upgrades and improvements by resources, which, as I mentioned earlier, would encourage them or provide them an opportunity to remain available and in the California markets longer if they choose to. Sorry, I'm just talking about for now, twenty percent adder in in the soft offer cap. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. And I understood that one to be primarily about the last thing I mentioned, which is you're trying your your objective is to compensate for going forward cost. And you need a number that will do that for high cost producers. Yes, I agree with you. The, um, the Sorry, go ahead. Okay, the, um, the price, the going forward costs reflected in the soft offer, offer cap calculation are those of a reference unit, not a specific unit. Um, and there will be some reference, there will be some specific units that whose total bid is less than the soft offer cap whose going forward costs are higher than those of the reference unit, there will be some with costs that are lower. So the 20% provides a cushion to make sure that they're all compensated. So if that's right, why isn't um, CPUC's criticism of FERC's reasoning spot on, which is um, the only discernible reasoning in the order is, well, we have a 20% adder there, so we can have a 20% adder here. But the 20% adder in the above cap rate, I mean, if, if the logic for the 20% adder in the default cap is we need to accommodate high cost producers who are on the, on the right-hand side of the bell, that bell curve, then if you start with such a high cost producer and then instead of giving him average plus 20, you give him actual cost, I mean, that would seem to obviate the need for another 20% on top of that. No, Your Honor, it does not, uh, it does not obviate the need for additional revenues because again, the, the above cap compensation is based just on going forward costs, not on full fixed costs. Um, there are, um, the commission has previously evaluated um, the question of paying only going forward costs as discussed on pages 32 and 33 of our briefs um, as to findings in other, um, uh, other regional systems. And here specifically in, in the 2018 uh, order on paragraph 44, where the commission noted that a resource at risk of retirement, which is the type you tend to see um, in, the, in the capacity procurement mechanism, is likely to need more um, than the compensation available bilaterally. Um, and what is available bilaterally, um, because that is a, because that's a competitive function, is going to be is going to be somewhat lower than um, what is available to uh, what is available in the capacity procurement mechanism. So it's designed to capture the difference between between going forward costs and other costs? Yes, Your Honor. It's, um, what the commission is trying to do here is to uh, identify a rate that is within the zone of reasonableness. Um, and- It just seems like, I mean, I, what do you do? What, what about a 
an average cost producer who can't say that um, can't say, well, I need more to account for the fact that my going forward costs are high mm -hmm. or, or even a low cost producer, are, are they allowed to um, go above cap on the theory, not, not, not that their going forward costs are higher, but that they need to be compensated for other costs that aren't going forward costs? A resource that's bidding above the offer cap would have to submit a cost justification filing to the commission. Um, and as we've been over already, first that offer would have to be accepted and there has never been an above cap offer accepted. And there's never been such a justification made to the, to the commission. So to answer your question, I think a lower, you know, a, a lower uh, price generator could try to do that. But first, but there are two, the two huge obstacles would be having its bid accepted and then having the commission find that it's that the bid is justified and that uh, the ISO could pay it. Getting back for a moment to the need to re to excuse me, you said yes, this in an above cap offer accepted. Yes. So when above they the soft cap. Oh yes, above, above the soft cap. cap. There's um, there has never been, uh, to my knowledge, um, since the soft offer cap was um, was it was implemented in 2015, a bid higher than the soft offer cap accepted for, uh, for use in the California ISO markets or a cost justification filing made to the commission. Were the, so this rate were is the bid submitted but not accepted. I don't know, Your Honor. Okay, so most of what we're talking about relates to bids that are above cap, none of which have ever been accepted, but might be in the future. Correct. So this is all, this is all very theoretical. But the 20% adder, if I understand it right, below cap bidders don't submit their costs, right? Mm -hmm. So the adder's intended for them to account the, to the variability in costs that you described, variability from, from the reference source. Yes. Um, but above cap do submit their costs. Yes. So the justification from the below cost context doesn't seem to carry over. What's the need for an adder once you've gotten actual costs demonstrated? Um, once again, Your Honor, the... Um, You're going to say because the costs that are demonstrated are less than the full fixed costs, right? Yes. So, and there's been a great. Why, there why, a, why not? Why does is it reasonable to do that rather than ask for show a showing of the full fixed costs at the same time as um, the going forward costs are submitted? There's nothing in the record to suggest whether that's reasonable or not because that is not the proposal made to the commission. The proposal fair, made fair to the enough, commission was. That's fair enough, but I don't see anything in the record or in the decision, I should say that justifies the 20% adder other than carrying it over from this other context for below cost, uh, below cap offers. There are a couple of guideposts in the, uh, in the commission's past decisions and also reflected in the record here. Um, there is agreement among market participants that the current rate for above cap resources is too high. Um, that's noted in the order at paragraph 12 and also at paragraphs 35 and 36. Um, where, that, what's too high? Um, the current rate, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the, I should say the previous rate that was in place from 2015 until this order. Right. The ISO wanted to replace that rate because market participants felt that it was too high. The commission did not make a finding as you know as to whether that rate had become unjust and unreasonable, but accepted the party's interest in changing it. So those are purchasers, I gather. They're complaining about the rate. Um, there were uh, purchasers and state entities complaining about the rate. Yes, okay. and on the other hand, that was Amicus the Calpine says it's too low. Wait a minute. That was the rate for for what above cap. Yes, that was the rate for above cap. It was calculated using a, def a different mechanism. 
Um, it, that was calculated using full fixed costs, um, plus a return of an on capital that ranged uh, that was set uh, previously set at 12.25%. So they thought it was too high uh, for rate for bids above the cap, none of which has ever been accepted. Correct. Got it. Um, again, Ms. Rylander, is, yes. may I ask you about paragraph five in the uh, FERC dissent by uh, now Chairman Glick? That last sentence about, well, he says first the 20% adder is particularly troubling because <clears throat> the CPM resources retain all market uh, revenues earned and so forth. Then he says, especially given the evidence of market power in the CPM process, the commission ought to provide some reason to believe that the 20% adder will be anything other than a windfall for high cost generators before finding it just and reasonable. What about this evidence of market power in the CPM process? Mm -hmm. Um, Your Honor, the Commission um, uh, in paragraph 41 of its order limited the scope of this case just to the rate proposal, um, and it chose not to, take up, not to take up the issues of how the capacity procurement mechanism as a whole was working. Um, the ISO will have to, uh, will have to revisit the, uh, uh, the, cap the capacity, I'm sorry, we'll have to revisit this particular rate starting as soon as next year. Um, I so would mention, though, that the, uh, the petitioner the, here. Excuse me, the 2020. Wait a minute. Has never been used. Will be re examined next year in the ordinary course? Um, the uh, California ISO tariff requires that every time, um, every time the California Energy Commission releases a new study of generator costs, um, the California ISO, in its stakeholder process, must review the soft offer cap and it's working. And if the California ISO wishes to make changes, then it has to submit those to the, uh, to the commission. Um, the tariff provision is cited in the commission's order. And footnote, I believe it's footnote nine, um, 43A.4.1.1.1, and it is appended to the back of the petitioner's brief. But where is that in the order in the JA joint appendix? Um, in the JA, it is page. Um, page two fifty five. Give me a moment here. Mm -hmm. I have it. What footnote? Nine. Um, also, paragraph five, Your Honor, um, uh, explain, explains that the ISO's tariff requires it to conduct a stakeholder process to revisit the soft offer cap at least every four years. And that, um, which is seen in the tariff provision, that is tied to the release of regular uh, California Energy Commission reports. So is there some reason to think that uh, the question of market power will be, will be uh, investigated at that point? It hasn't been in the past, I guess. I can't say, Your Honor. If well, I think that I think Judge Ginsburg is asking the same thing I asked originally. In other words, the dissent says you haven't considered the market power of the CPM uh, regime, and you pointed to the majority or the order from FERC saying we're not going to do that now. That's their. I mean, they don't explain why they aren't. They're just not going to do it now. And then Judge Ginsburg, I think you answered him saying they may never, <clears throat> they may never do it. Am I right? I can't speculate on what will happen in a future commission proceeding that hasn't begun at this point, Your Honor. Um, I would, uh, would certainly expect that if there are market power problems, they will be brought to the commission's attention, um, either via complaint or in future capacity procurement mechanism rate cases. This is 
not a filing that deals with the overall structure of the capacity procurement mechanism or the way it works um, or how the California ISO uses it. It's limited to the very narrow um, issue of compensation for a small set of resources. Um, and once again, it's never, you know, if for the hypothetic, so far hypothetical situation in which such, um, uh, such payments are necessary. But if the justification, what you're right, what's before FERC is the, a tariff amendment limited to above cap offers. Mm -hmm. But if FERC's justification is, well, this seems okay because the formula appears analogous to what happens for below cap offers, which seem not a helpful fact for you it, that if FERC has not examined at all what happens, the reasonableness of the below cap offers. Your Honor, I think we got away from this issue a few minutes ago, and I um, would like to, to re-explain that the commission was not merely looking at the level of below cap compensation and saying, well, that worked in 2015, that'll probably work now. It does have other precedent in, um, in, other, ca in other cases concerning this and other ISOs in which it's found that going forward costs alone, which is the pinpoint rate the California Commission would like to substitute here, are too low. Um, that's in our brief at 32 to 33, and also described in the 2018 order. And there's also evidence in the record that the current cap rate for above cap resources, which is full fixed costs plus a return of it on capital, is too high. Um, that's uh, mentioned in, in the order at paragraphs 12 and 35 to 36. And even Commissioner Glick said that, you know, that this rate is, you know, is at least a step in the right direction. Um, it is possible, um, it is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, what the California Commission, which never mentioned windfall profits, um, I believe until its reply brief, um, had to say, uh, had to, um, would like us to do is to substitute a pinpoint rate that the commission knows is not, uh, the commission knows is not sufficient to compensate expensive resources um, for something that appears to the commission to at least be in the range of just and reasonable and which will remain under the commission's oversight in the future. How do they know that it's insufficient if they have no experience with actual uh, bidding on it. What the commission has found in the past, Your Honor, is that um, going forward costs with which it does have experience alone are insufficient. Well, the going forward cost, which is demonstrated in 2020 proposal, has to be shown, right? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, please? In, under the 2020 order, the fixed the going forward fixed costs are actually shown. They're demonstrated before the, or at some point, uh, to prove the, what the actual number is. For Yes, for a below cap resource, the going forward costs of the reference rate are demonstrated, or the reference unit are demonstrated. And for an above cap resource, the going forward costs of the specific unit are demonstrated. Right, so they get their going forward costs and they get fixed operating and maintenance expenses and taxes, right? Taxes, insurance, and so on. Yes. And then they get the adder. Yes. On top of that. Mm -hmm. And they have market revenues. Yes, but we must presume, Judge Henderson, we cannot, we cannot assume anything about market revenues because it is not necessarily the case that a unit that is whose capacity bid is acceptable and that is available in the capacity market will ever be called upon to provide energy. Two cases, two recent cases concerning just this situation that we did not cite in our brief um, are uh, Duke Energy v. FERC 892 F 3rd 416 and Old Dominion v. FERC 892 F 3rd 1223. Those both concern capacity resources in a different system that lost money because while they were paid to be available, they were prepared and they purchased fuel in order to run 
at, at very expensive fuel in order to run, and then we're not called upon to run. So market revenues, um, while market revenues are more complicated, that it is a more complicated concept than simply assuming some positive number, which I think is what the California Commission is doing here. It we seems, really can't consider them. Seems that therefore so this uh, segregation that you have between the capacity market and the energy market, right? Yes. Um, seems to say if the if the end result of the two is a windfall profit, that's really not our business. One of our business. That doesn't make the rate unreasonable. I do not expect that FERC, whose mission is to ensure just and reasonable rates, would ever countenance windfall profits, Your Honor. Um, and that's How will, we know? How will one know, <laughs> given <laughs> the 20% adder without any demonstration mm -hmm. of the other, well, beyond the forward, going forward costs? We will have real world data if this ever occurs. And if it does, the commission has tools at its disposal to change the rate in the form of Federal Power Act Section 206, um, or to further investigate the rate or otherwise to make changes. What we don't have is any showing that there will definitely be windfall profits or anything of that nature. And in the capacity market, do you regard market power as so essentially irrelevant because when this capacity is called upon, it's a uh, an unusual and urgent situation in which demand is is uh, the price is, is uh, the price of the offered is very high. A price the price that uh, the market clearing price let's say is very high because of the basically urgent circumstances, and therefore um, uh, whatever it takes is reasonable. Um, I think that is reading more into the commission's order than is there, Your Honor. But what is, again, the, the vast bulk of the capacity procurement mechanism is bilateral and is competitive and is intended, uh, is intended to find some sort of, uh, some, some sort of um, clearing price may not be the right, may not be the right term, but is intended to find a competitive price for capacity. Right. And I think that, I, I will find out more in rebuttal, but it seems to me the, the California Commission's complaint is analogous to saying um, where there is uh, price, so-called price gouging because of the urgency of the matter, um, the result will be uh, higher than just and reasonable rates. I would say that is their concern, Your Honor, yes. And, and of course, the there, all, there will only be actual transactions when there is this great urgency and very high rates for bringing capacity online or keeping uh, it. I presume so, Your Honor, yes. All right, thank you. All right, if Judge Cassis, do you have any more questions? Nothing further. All right, uh, Ms. Moy, why don't you take two minutes and also answer any questions? Thank you, Your Honor. Now, I have to correct several things that Ms. Rylander said about this tariff that are simply wrong. First, she said that um, going forward costs alone, that the commission has found those to be not sufficient payments in a voluntary backstop capacity market. Now, that is contrary to the commission's orders that it issued in the New York ISO addressing a reliability must run backstop program where it said that that is enough. That's the minimum that needs to be paid. And that's because as Judge uh, Katzis said and hit, it, hit the nail right on the point, um, paying the actual going forward costs of the resource obviates the need for additional revenues. And the commission just repeatedly flips the burden of proof in this case. The burden of proof is not on the commission to demonstrate that market revenues are not sufficient the burden is on the commission to demonstrate that the adder is just and reasonable and not going to result in windfall profits, has no data, no evidence, no analysis whatsoever of how market revenues supplement the CPM earnings. And the Department of Market Monitoring, Pacific Gas and Electric, and the CPUC all put in evidence showing the market revenues are enough and asked the commission 
and the ISO to do an assessment. And it has never done that. It's exactly like the case, the Delaware Division of the Public Advocate. The second thing she said incorrectly is that risk of retirement resources are the types of capacity you're likely to see in this CPN market. Now that is incorrect. Risk of retirement designations are no longer available in this backstop market. That was approved in 2011. The ISO asked to add a risk of retirement designation. And in just last year, the commission approved a comprehensive set of reforms the ISO has been pursuing to move the risk of retirement designation into its mandatory reliability must run backstop program. And that's where the ISO says itself, resources can and should go to get recovery of additional costs above their fixed costs if they need them to stay in service. And then, you know, finally, I just want to point out, um, she also suggested that the commission could correct a rate or deny a rate if in a section 205 filing, it turns out to show that it's unjust and unreasonable, that it's too high. And I don't want to put words into my opponent's, future opponent's mouths, but I am very certain that if the CPUC showed up in one of these proceedings and said, no, you can't give them this 20% adder, the rate is too high, this resource doesn't need it, that would be deemed a collateral attack on the commission's order here because it's approving the automatic inclusion of the adder, whether the resource needs it or not. There's no demonstration required. The resource doesn't even need to claim that it will use the money for anything other than windfall profits, which by the way, can harm other sellers who are competing in these markets. And now Judge Henderson, you asked me to answer a question. I wanna make sure I address that. If you can repeat what- Oh, question. no, no, I just said answer any questions we have. I don't have any. Okay, well then I just, I just wanna also make one sorry, point in sorry. closing. Uh, hold on a second. So you're saying if the FERC initiated a proceeding to, to investigate or correct or to reject these filed rates as being unreasonably high, that would be barred as a collateral attack? No, Your Honor, what I'm saying is in its um, brief, the commission has pointed to this process where to go above this soft offer cap, a resource has to make a section 205 filing with the commission. It shows what its actual going forward costs are. And that's where the commission gives that approval for the filed rate. And Ms. Rylander has suggested um, in her answer today that the commission could correct that rate there if it looks like that's going to be too high for a resource. And what I am saying is that's incorrect because the commission's order here guarantees the extra 20% automatically. And so if the CPC tried to oppose that, it could be deemed a collateral attack. Oh, if you tried to oppose it, I see. Okay. Right. And then always after the fact, you know, if if, if things go haywire, oops, let me, sorry. Let me, just, let me just make sure I got that. You're saying that in the later, the later proceeding would adjudicate the question of what the actual going forward costs were. It could not relitigate the question of whatever that is, you get that plus 20% more. That would certainly be an argument parties would make. And um, <clears throat> and it's significant okay, would they because- be, Excuse me, would they be invoking the filed right doctrine? Is that what would happen? I think it would be a collateral attack because here the commission is approving a new method and it's part of a comprehensive set of reforms. And the intention was to streamline and simplify this process. So while resources may have never actually gotten authority to use an above cap price before, the whole intention of this is to make it a shorter form. It's a much, uh, it's only four categories of costs instead of around 20, and they get that automatic 20% adder. It's, it's not the same as fully litigating what the cost of service is for the resource. That's the change the commission is making to the above cap rate. And it's making that change because resources can always get their full cost of service by going through the, the California ISO's mandatory capacity backstop program, that's the reliability must run program, 
if they are needed to stay in operation for reliability. But that's not a choice that the resource owner can make. That's a choice that the, uh, the ISO makes. No, the resource owner can make that choice. Yeah. And the ISO... Can say, yeah. I, I, how can the resource say, you mu- it's, uh, it's mandatory, you must buy my capacity? If the resource is saying that it's not making enough money from the market revenues, um, and that it's actually going to have to shut down or mothball, it goes to the ISO and it says, you know, we're planning to de- de-issue. Right. And then the ISO, if that resource is needed for reliability, it will evaluate what long-term costs, upgrades, cost of service is needed by that resource to keep it in service. But here, this capacity procurement mechanism is a short-term market. The ISO itself pointed out These are usually one to two month designations. Many of them are for partial units. And the ISO itself, I really invite you to look at JA21. The ISO itself says, this is not the program to provide long-term costs for uh, environmental and other upgrades. It says that should be done in the reliability must run program. And so again, the commission here has said, well, there's no, there's no evidence that the 20% will overcompensate, but that's not the burden. The commission's order has to be support, supported by substantial evidence. In this case, it is not supported by any evidence at all. It's not even close to a scintilla, it is zero. The only basis for its decision is that, well, we approve this 20% adder for the soft offer cap itself in connection with proxy resource, so we'll, we'll approve it here. And just one other thing to point out, the ISO revisits this price every so often. In the reform, in the stakeholder process that was just finished, the parties demonstrated that that soft offer cap price is too high, that the CPM solicitations have become structurally uncompetitive. And parties asked the ISO to lower it, but It didn't do that. In the Section 205 filing, it only recommended changing the above soft offer cap. So if we're going to get that soft offer cap change, we have to file a Section 206 complaint. But that's not part of your your concern in the current proceeding, right? In this court, you haven't challenged that. We That is not before the court because it would have to come through a Section 206 complaint. But those very same concerns, the very same evidence showing that that soft offer cap formula itself with the 20% adder has become overcompensatory, that is leading to unjust and unreasonable rates, and that there's market power being exerted in California today, that those same arguments compel the commission to do more than it has done here. It is not balancing the interests of consumers against the needs of sellers that it is required to do. It hasn't considered consumers at all. Only now Chairman Glick has done that in his dissent and he reaches the right outcome here. All right, are there any more questions? No, all right, thank you. Thank you. If you will adjourn court, please, Madam Clerk. This honorable court is now adjourned until Tuesday, October 12th at 9.30 a.m.